you're ready, Dr. Right. Gomi. Sure. <clears throat> yes, I'll jump in. So, hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. This is our first uh, installment of our Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Echo. And so we're, we're starting on the heels of Dr. Seiss finishing his Addictions Echo. And we also, you know, we also have a, a perinatal echo that we've been running. So we're trying to expand, you know, our topics. And we thought after doing, some of you may have been a part of the TikTok series that was kind of nursing home and trauma-informed care focused last year. It's already been a year, if you can believe it. Um, we thought, you know, this uh, was a topic of great interest to the membership and, and, and kind of the community of Mountain Pacific. And so we wanted to spend some more time on it and really dedicate uh, more information uh, and attention. So Alzheimer's Association has also helped out significantly here. They've, they've helped us uh, provide actually most of the content. Um, and we, know we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, they've done amazing work nationally with distributing and, and content. And they also run many echoes nationally. So we really wanted to kind of take uh, lessons learned from them, um, content they have, and then really customize it for Montana, Wyoming, Hawaii, Alaska, Pacific Islands. And so we can focus a little more, you know, on rural relevant information or just kind of issues that come up in, in these areas. So that's kind of how this came about. And you'll see there's 10 sessions every other week for the next several months. Uh, today's session is gonna focus on the biology and causes of dementia. Um, and and, and want to say thank you again to Mountain Pacific for, for really putting this on, administrating it, and really getting all the details together, Alzheimer's Association for the content, um, and, and of course, Project ECHO that we are uh, conforming to here. So <clears throat> and just a little note about um, continuing education uh, for nursing continuing education. So just make a note of this. Um, it's is in line with our previous uh, teaching as well. Um, disclosures. So, from the uh, standpoint of myself, you know, uh, Dr. Arzubi is not involved with this series, so he he won't be teaching. But primarily, being me, uh, Reza Hosseini Gomi, um, you know, I work with uh, BrainCheck, um, Frontier Psychiatry. I do dementia talks for Biogen as well, and then Amber here has also uh, listed her her disclosures. So, in terms of announcements. This is where we would just kind of make any, any big announcements coming up, you know, for folks, if you're able to, you know, we, we want people to participate. So if you're able to share your video throughout, great. Um, feels you know, a bit more of a community. The, the echo model is really more of this community-based model where we're taking in, you know, um, cases from the community. So that's, that's always wonderful. Um, feel free to, you know, unmute yourself and ask questions uh, and, and jump in anytime. Um, or you can on Zoom, you can kind of raise your hand. But yeah, just some basic etiquette stuff, just so we're, you know, we don't get crowded out with noise or background noise, things like that. Any other um, announcements, Amber? That I can think of, just to remember to smile, put your cameras on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So with that, we'll, we'll kind of jump into just a quick brief uh, reintroduction of ECHO for those of you that are new to this model. This is from University of New Mexico, and it's become a national model. It's basically a hub and spoke model for how do we get information from hubs of information and expertise out into the community where uh, people on the ground are you know, very busy uh, taking care of folks. And then we'll get into a didactic, uh, biology and causes of dementia, and then we'll kind of go over a case. So again, uh, Project ECHO, uh, this is the kind of learning outcomes for today. We'll go over the sessions that are coming up, didactic case, and then next session. So as I was mentioning, you know, this hub and spoke model, really the idea is how do we take the knowledge from, you know, a few specialists and try to expand it to as many people as possible, there, thereby having an impact on more patients, right? So that's really the, the, where this came from. And so we're not directly seeing patients, right? Those experts are not seeing the patients, but they're really teaching and providing consultation to cases from other providers and staff. <clears throat> so Mount Pacific, uh, again, being the, the leader here in terms of putting this on, and then Alzheimer's Association helping us tremendously with the content. Um, just take a moment here for, with the, for the Mount Pacific crowd, just to kind of introduce folks, uh, for those of you who may not be uh, familiar. So Amber, if you want to start. Amber Rogers with Mountain Pacific, and I live in Missoula, Montana. And I, you will be getting lots of emails 
from me to say, remember, we need your cases. So uh, respond, thanks. <laughs> I'm Mary Argonis from Mountain Pacific in the Hawaii office, and I'll be your IT support. Thanks. Anyone else from Mountain Pacific on? Great. Um, and anyone from, I'm not sure if there's anyone from Alzheimer's Association here with us today. There may not be. And then in terms of subject matter experts, you know, so I'm kicking this off today. You know, I'm a neuropsychiatrist by training. Uh, I did movement disorder neurology fellowship after uh, psychiatry residency. And I also did uh, a couple of years of behavioral neurology clinic. So really honed in on neurodegeneration. That's my main interest. And so I, I went, kind of went deep into the diagnostic treatment and management of any neurodegeneration, whether it's, you know, the Parkinson's movement type of disorder spectrum, Huntington's, all the way, really a lot of focus on Alzheimer's and related dementias. So I, I kind of, you know, I, I like to spend my time really honing in on what the diagnosis is and customizing treatment plans. And so I'll be obviously sharing, you know, my, my knowledge and what I've learned over the years. Um, I've also invited a number of faculty and community experts to join us. And so throughout the series, you will be hearing from, from other folks. Um, if there's any uh, dementia experts or geriatricians on the call now, feel free to introduce yourself with, with my screen the way it is. I can't quite see everyone all at once, um, but please do jump in. But you will certainly hear from folks. Uh, we wanted to kind of give an opportunity to hear different perspectives. Um, and and, and or if, there's, if there's anyone in the audience that has a certain expert they really like or wants to hear from, let me know and I can I'll do my best to invite them to, to join in. And then participants, uh, kind of these spoke teams, you know, um, is anyone able to uh, unmute themselves and just mention like kind of just briefly kind of who you are and, and where you're calling in from? So um, I can pick on a few people since I know a few of the folks that I, I recognize uh, your names. Um, how about uh, Joby Flynn? Way out there in Wolf Point. Hi, everybody. Don't you love being called out? Well, I had a mouthful of lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and Eileen Ford, uh, she's one of our um, folks from Wyoming that helps with our community coalitions. Hi, everybody. Yes, Eileen Ford, and I am in charge of several um, quality improvement coalitions in Wyoming, and I'm based out of Casper. Awesome. And then I saw Britta from St. Luke's, my neck of the woods. Hello, I'm Britta. I'm a nurse um, care manager at um, St. Luke. Awesome. Anybody else want to jump in? I see, um, I think that there's a couple of folks from Hawaii on. Everybody, this is Maggie. I'm from um, Mountain Pacific in Hawaii. Good to see you. Awesome. And anybody from Alaska? Don't be shy. I saw one of you register. Hi, my name is Katrina Audison. I'm from Wrangell, Alaska, a nurse up here, nurse educator. Awesome. Thank you much. And uh, it like, yeah, Rihanna from Billings Clinic uh, entered into the chat. So if, if yeah, folks are in the middle of eating or anything, go ahead. Yeah, put in the chat uh, where you, who you are and where you're from, uh, no worries. So we've got a good, good little spread here. Definitely a good, strong Montana showing. Wonderful. Please, yeah, keep, keep entering those and we'll just kind of keep moving forward. Um, so again, you know, I think this will kind of flow naturally, but we'll do a didactic, might, might kind of go over that 10 to 15 minute today. And, and I'll make adjustments as we get cases. So since it's our first, you know, because I wasn't expecting cases for today, but future really gonna want folks in the community to uh, share cases. We'll go over the case presentation form later um, to help guide you uh, with submitting those uh, because that's really where the meat of the learning happens is kind of trying to take those real cases that you're, you might be working on and, and kind of go over them and how to, how to just view them from a different perspective. And so, <clears throat> And just a little review here of the topic schedule. 
So today we're starting with diseases causing dementia, and you can see spaced out every couple of weeks. We're going to be touching on signs and symptoms of cognitive impairment, how to assess for cognitive impairment in nursing homes and primary care offices, um, how to go ahead and, you know, the next session evaluate and diagnose, um, when to bring in specialty testing, uh, care planning, um, communicating findings to patients and caregivers, big topic, right? It's a lot of what I do is trying to communicate to families. Um, integration of family and caregivers, so how to really bring in the whole treatment program or treatment plan and, and bring everyone in from the community. Um, care management, uh, we're going we're to spend time on several topics there. So uh, addressing the role and needs of caregivers, cognition, comorbidities, behavioral and psychological symptoms, a big topic, you know, because that's in dementia, that's the rule, not the exception, that there will be um, changes in behavior, psychological symptoms, depression, anxiety, and so on, and how to, how to really manage that. So we'll definitely try, and that'll be, and some of this is going to be weaved throughout, but we'll have topic or days that would really focus on that. So we'll jump into today's didactic. Uh, I'm going to spend a chunk of time going through this, and then we'll go through the uh, case presentation form. So for this didactic today, you know, the, the focus really is, I want folks to feel more comfortable describing the types of dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. Um, I really want you all to feel comfortable answering questions from patients and family um, and, and make some progress towards that. I'd go over the different severities of Alzheimer's disease or the three stages or states, and then the risk factors for Alzheimer's. What I'd like to do is start by showing this graph. This is a few years old now from a paper. Um, <clears throat> the, the point here is I, want, I really like starting off by showing people, well, what's normal aging, right? Well, when we're talking about dementia, you know, that can be a pretty scary thing. And so often earlier in life, uh, maybe in your, you know, your 40s, 50s, 60s, you start having some changes that you just start questioning. Now, <clears throat> what I like to do is point out on this graph that, and again, mean T-scores on the left, meaning these are population-based averages. Think of it that way. Um, and so we're not showing the full spectrum. So although the, the graph, some of these look like they're downtrending quite a bit, it's, it's all still within a normal range. So keep that in mind. There's not a lot of, it's not a huge, we're just zoomed in. And then you can see across the age here, all the way from you know, your 20s to your 80s. Now, what's interesting now, look, if you look at something like verbal ability or um, numeric ability, see those things increase well into your 40s, even 50s, and then they stay there. They don't, you know, they shouldn't really be declined. And so when uh, people will say, oh, you know, I'm having a little bit of trouble driving at night as I get older, I'm having trouble with my processing speed. I'm just not quite as fast, you know, especially with technology, you know, changing all the time. Um, well, those are things that naturally see in um, inductive reasoning, spatial orientation, perceptual speed. Those are things that naturally do decline slowly with age, but not to a point to make it not normal or not to a point that will actually limit your functioning. You'll still be able to pay your bills. You'll still be able to answer your emails, drive, things like that. But you just have to be more and more careful. You might have to make some accommodations. It's when these things become more impaired, we'll get into this, that, that we start worrying about dementia. So again, you know, people say, oh, I'm, I'm not paying attention. I'm having trouble remembering names. Uh, you know, thing, I'm forgetting little things. Those are all part of normal aging. And honestly, most of the time that comes down to sleep quality, um, other symptoms, um, attention being distracted because there's just more and more, you know, in the world we live in, there's so many distractions. So keep that in mind as we kind of now talk about the different stages of um, cognitive impairment. Now, what we've learned over time is that mild cognitive impairment really is this stage of impairment that tends to almost always precede dementia. I mean, there are cases where you might have a massive stroke or something might happen where that, that stage is gonna be either little or not at all. But almost everyone with Alzheimer's, you can just kind of assume everyone with Alzheimer's has mild cognitive impairment for a number of years prior to, to then meeting the criteria for dementia. What mild cognitive impairment, all that means is, is that there's a measurable change in their cognition, meaning you do their MOCA, you do their slums, you do their MMSC, you do any kind of brain testing, screening tool, or neuropsychological testing. If there's measurable abnormal uh, impairment and you've ruled out, you know, uh, it's a, you know, they didn't come to you and not slept for three days, they're not on substances and so on. You know, these are the modifiable or reversible issues. But if this is a longstanding trend, there are not any other clear reasons for it they're healthy otherwise, and you can measure cognitive impairment, that's mild cognitive impairment. It could be in their 50s, it could be in their 60s, it could be 70s, 80s. I mean, it doesn't matter really the age, 
you know, mild cognitive impairment really in, in, in cases of Alzheimer's, you're really starting, you know, usually in your 60s, 70s, and then kind of slowly increasing. So that's a long, long stage. And this is the stage that's most important to catch people, characterize people, and start kind of interventions because you can have a big impact on the, their, their life and, and how their progression goes. Dementia is that measurable change and impairment in their day-to-day -day life. So people now all of a sudden can't do their finances anymore, driving, they're, they're having trouble at work, following a recipe, things like that. That's, that's when it really becomes dementia. And you have to have impairment in two or more domains. We'll go over that in more, more detail. We don't know why, right, the cause. We don't know the cause. Dementia and mild cognitive, these are purely about functioning. This is, has nothing about why. I could have dementia because of a vascular disease. I could have dementia because of Alzheimer's. I could have dementia because of you know, all kinds of other reasons. But that's not what this is about. Dementia, making that diagnosis, that's why all of us here can make this diagnosis because it's about day-to-day -day functioning. So just drilling down on that a little bit more, you know, keep in mind this um, prodromal phase, this pre-symptomatic phase, we know there's a phase of multiple years that, that we, we know now of brain pathology, that biology, those, those abnormal proteins in most cases building up in your brain. And then this prodromal or mild cognitive impairment stage tends to kind of happen here where your functioning, you know, is still normal, but it's something slipping. There's this gradual accumulation of proteins that shouldn't be there. And then you hit this point where you kind of cross over and that's when you have dementia. That's when your day-to-day -day functioning is impaired. So for many, many years. So now we're realizing that by the time we've diagnosed Alzheimer's disease, maybe as much as 10, 20 years prior was something building up, the protein, something in that kind of biology was going wrong. <clears throat> you know, one thing I really like to spend time on here, because this comes up all the time for me every day, um, you know, this is dementia, there's no cure, why bother? Well, why are we doing this uh, echo series? Why are we doing, you know, CMEs and all this? Um, rest assured that, you know, studies over time, over and over and over again, demonstrate at large population scales, if we diagnose correctly early on, identify symptoms accurately, and plan appropriately for the future, we have massive impact on patients' lives. Even if we're saying they have Alzheimer's, it is absolutely not a death sentence. It is not, uh, okay, let's just give up and roll over. People, depending on what we do earlier in life, and then also, later. I mean, some people come to our attention later, but regardless of at what point you intervene, you will have multi-year impact on their quality of life and longevity. That we know. I mean, study after study has shown this, and there's lots of areas to intervene, and that's what we'll go over during the series. But there has to be a sort of a level of faith and really a belief here, and it's, it's hard when it's something that's moving slowly, you know, and it's hard because it's been hundreds of years, right, of, of oh my god, it's dementia, what am I going to do? But we know now there's actually quite a bit we can do. And meant much of it, in fact, the majority of it is not even medication-based. Um, so there's so much we can all do. So I wanna really, really drive that home. That That's the reason I do this work is because I love seeing the, the reward of impact and improvement in quality of health of people. Um, it's a multidisciplinary team approach. You know, it takes everyone that's participating today, that's why you're here, it takes everyone from the entire team. There's not just, that's how it is. And, that, and you need that to have the best outcomes. Um, the other option, you know, the other sort of points I like to make is, well, I want to be able to provide my patients with treatments as soon as it becomes available. You know, something that was all over the headlines this past year was that new Biogen drug, Aduhelm, I think they call it. I'm not, you know, I'm not super expert on it, but, um, and I'm not, we're not here to talk about that, but the point is a new drug came out. It was the first disease, you know, labeled as a first disease modifying drug for dementia and Alzheimer's. Well, guess what? Over half of the five to 7 million people in the US that have Alzheimer's do not have the diagnosis, over half. Well, guess what? They're not gonna get that treatment. So if you think about back where we were in the 70s or 80, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s with cancer, we, we weren't as good at telling you what kind of cancer you had, what stage. And now, you know, you go into the doctor, you get drilled down. You get like, you know, look at your um, slides under a microscope. You get this stage with this, this, and this protein and that. And you know exactly what treatment to get. And look how far we've come. That's what dementia is going through now. I mean, this is, this is the progress we're making. We're becoming much more targeted in our treatments. 
we're looking at new disease modifying treatments. There's hundreds of clinical trials going on in the US right now with potentially disease modifying agents. So there's quite a bit that I'm anticipating will become more and more available. But before we get there, we have to be you know, diagnosing and, and accurately labeling our patients. And then, and then even to participate in those research trials, right? How can we develop new therapeutics if we don't have correctly diagnosed or, or correctly treated patients? So this is all working together to improve dementia, some of it today with our patients today and some of it over the long run you know, with new treatments. <clears throat> Let's jump into potentially treatable causes of mild cognitive impairment and dementia. And, and, and I'll touch on this uh, throughout the series uh, in a bit more in detail as we go through. So depression, right? We used to call this pseudo-dementia. Why do we call it that? Because depression in older ages can absolutely mimic dementia. So treating de depression, all of a sudden, people's memory and function get better. Thyroid disease, very common as we age. You know, we see, you guys, I'm sure, are used to seeing lots of patients on thyroid medication because it's very common. Um, and when your thyroid gets lower, and it's naturally kind of fading, it will have an impact on your memory um, and your attention. Vitamin B12 deficiency, depending on where you are, it's, it's really regional and, and kind of a little bit cultural. So um, that can be an issue. Always good to check that early on. Uh, seizure disorders, we always have to kind of have on our, on our radar because they can be a little atypical as well as you get older and not as obvious. Sleep apnea, think about what a common issue that is. I mean, sleep apnea is such a, a common issue nowadays. If you're untreated um, and, and you're not sleeping well during the night, boy, are you gonna have an impact on your thinking during the day? And it could look like dementia. Um, a very common issue. So what we work at with Frontier Psychiatry, growing list of geriatric patients, a lot of nursing homes now, because we're going in trying to address polypharmacy, um, medications, various, uh, and the, um, so the family medicine kind of, community puts out these beers criteria that have been around a long time that lists a you know, long list of what to avoid as you get older. Uh, and I said, geri the geriatric medicine community, sorry. And so they, they really highlight, you know, places where you can have a big impact. I mean, I don't think a, a day goes by where I'm not seeing a patient that had a clear improvement in their cognition based on adjustments to their medication. You could be on medication long-term when you were younger that you just can't get away with when you're older. Um, these are things that happen. They're just kind of a natural thing that happens sometimes, you know, and it's easy to fix. And so these are all, these are all things we can address. And even if you're not a prescriber, we need you to be on alert and pointing those things out. It's good to be aware of it and say, Hey, you know, this patient's been on the sleep medication for 10 years and now they're in their seventies. I'm not sure. Should we address that? These are all things that help bring it to their doctor's attention or their prescriber's attention. Um, more uh, treatable causes. So delirium, very, very common, right? Especially if you're working in a, in a residential facility, folks with dementia or with underlying disease are much more likely to get delirium when they're medically ill. So a UTI or a pneumonia in someone who's 80 and otherwise healthy, they just kind of feel crappy and say, oh, you know, I have a cough, my air burns when I pee, things like that. If that person has underlying Alzheimer's disease, they may not say any of those things, right? We've seen this time and time again. They may uh, act in a very bizarre manner. They might start visually hallucinating. They might be up all night and so on. Have no idea what's going on, but guess what? It's most of the time when you see those big changes, think to yourself, medical illness, we should be checking their urine. We should be checking, you know, for pneumonia, things like that, illness. So delirium, very, very common. This is, some, this is a medical urgent issue that needs to be addressed. This is not dementia. This is a symptom of an underlying medical issue. Um, anytime their electrolytes go out of balance, we see this unfortunately when patients are failing at home, early stages of dementia, when they're still trying to hang on, you know, they stop eating well, they stop drinking, um, they might have some kidney damage, um, there might be drugs involved, alcohol very commonly, smoking. So these are all things that will tank their cognition that we can absolutely reverse. Here's a graph, which I like to point out. This is from the Lancet. This is a coalition of a huge group of international experts that put this together. This was revised in 2020, so it's pretty new. Now, just to put you guys, again, put it in perspective, based on this, they, they add up that they think potentially modifiable or preventable dementia, 40% of dementias could be potentially modifiable or preventable. Look at, that's a huge number. Now, some of this is later in life that's, that we can address right away. Like look at these percentile risks of increase of dementia, depending on the behavior. So smoking, um, symptoms of depression, right? Social isolation, physical inactivity, air pollution, diabetes. Look at that, that adds up to a big chunk there. 
Midlife, and this is something I use to motivate my middle-aged patients that refuse to wear their hearing aids. Look at that hearing loss, huge percentage. So anytime you have someone, it's very common, especially guys, uh, they're, uh, you know, where are your hearing aids, buddy? Uh, I don't know, I left them at home. Nope, you're gonna get dementia. Oh God, okay, I'll wear my hearing aids. So um, use that, use that, you know, as a little uh, motivator. TBI, you know, earlier in life, hypertension, alcohol, obesity. These are things that are so important to because they, they accumulate over years and years. So you want to get that early. And of course, education level is one of the biggest predictors. And that's unfortunately, you know, once you're older, um, that impact is harder to have because it really is early life education has, has a big impact. Let's jump into uh, focusing a bit on diseases causing dementia now. So Again, we've been using this term um, umbrella term dementia. We talked about this impairment in functioning and measurable cognitive change that was required to diagnose dementia. So two or more areas of functioning plus measurable impairment equals dementia. Well, now what's the biology? What's causing the dementia? Well, we've mentioned Alzheimer's because that's the most common one, especially in the US. Um, let me just go, yeah, number one in the US. Now, number two in the US is actually all the way over here on the right, vascular dementia. Okay, so, and those, keep in mind, the Venn diagram of them uh, is heavily overlapped, meaning many people have mixed Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. Vascular dementia just means because of that obesity, diabetes, cholesterol, inactivity, and many of those factors we talk about our whole lives, vascular disease, just the way it builds up in our coronary arteries, it builds up in other, you know, and causes other end organ damage, it builds up in our brains. And that causes vascular dementia eventually. And we can see that on a brain MRI very well. So it's very helpful in that early workup. We'll talk about this in a later, later talk. That's why we get that brain imaging. Alzheimer's disease, we're getting better about seeing also uh, structurally, anatomically, but that it follows a pretty, a, a generally very predictable pattern of changes. Um, we also have on here Parkinson's disease dementia. So that's uh, essentially, you know, we, we like to say, you know, medically, if any of us lived to 120, you know, if we all lived to 120, you'd be amazed at how high percentage of those people would have Parkinson's. So some of this is just risk of, you know, living a long time because there's parts of your brain that just aren't uh, evolutionarily adapted to lasting for 120 years. And so Parkinson's happen is increases significantly with age. Um, and then if you live long enough, um, you can start having that dementia. Lewy body dementia, you might have heard of too. You know, that was a famous person, Robin Williams had Lewy body dementia. That's what he died from. He was misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder for a long time. And so he, this actually was undiagnosed until after he passed away. This was all on postmortem. That was, that was a big uh, kind of headline. And his wife wrote a really nice letter to the neurology community about it uh, after that happened. It was very helpful. So, and then multiple system atrophy. These are all kind of in this Lewy body realm. Lewy body is actually the same as what causes Parkinson's disease. So these are kind of the same thing. It's just a matter of what they look like. Parkinson's being the movement issues that we know classically early on, Lewy body being the memory issues early on. But Lewy body dementia, you will have Parkinson's symptoms as well. Multiple uh, system atrophy. Th there's a, these are, so these are getting, some of this is getting to the rare stuff that I, you, know, you, you can essentially rely on someone like me to help figure that out. But Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body, more common. Frontotemporal dementia, a little less common. Um, and it's named after the fact that it, it affects your frontal and temporal regions right behind your ears. So there's a lot of memory and behavior changes or mood changes. Um, progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal. These are things that, I'm, you know, again, rare things, but things that I do see and diagnose, but uncommonly. There's um, language variants of some of these diseases. So there's atypical, there's frontal variant Alzheimer's, there's logopenic, primary progressive aphasia. There's a lot of other dementias to me, very scientifically interesting for the purposes of, for the community here, I just want you to know that the vast majority of people you're going to see, the biology that's causing their cognitive change is probably Alzheimer's or vascular or mix of both. Also commonly we'll see Parkinson's, Lewy body, and a little less commonly frontotemporal dementia. Those are the, the ones that you're going to see the vast majority of them. That, that accounts for over, well over 90% of dementias, okay? Now, something I was kind of getting to on the last slide getting a little more into the biology. I just think it's, it's helpful. And again, this is not, you don't need to memorize this. I just want you to be aware. We've come a long way in understanding dementias. And this is what's opening the door to future research and treatment, right? Because now we know more and more about what's causing it. When we say tauopathy, that's one of the proteins that's also causes Alzheimer's. 
Um, but when we say PS, progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration, frontotemporal lobar degeneration, with Parkinsonism, Pick's disease, that's an old term that you might be familiar with um, that's been around a long time. So these are caused by the tau protein. That's all it means by tauopathy is that the tau protein is common in these diseases. Alpha synuclein, which is actually under the microscope, what we call a Lewy body, I was just named after. So it gets confusing sometimes because we you know we're naming things after the person who found it a long time ago. Parkinson's Lewy body multiple system atrophy. These are alpha synuclein. That's the protein that's building up and causing the damage. These proteins, something goes haywire, they accumulate and they kill those neurons. And that's what causes the damage. That's what causes the decline. Amyloid beta and tau together, that's Alzheimer's disease. So you can see there's this, this similar tau in both in, in this cluster too. And then other forms. So frontotemporal lobar degeneration, which is the biology of frontotemporal dementia. So this was kind of a famous one that, that was discovered several years ago, C9 open reading frame 72. This is the frontotemporal dementia that we see very commonly with ALS. So this gene actually um, explains, it's the most common cause of ALS, um, specifically as a gene. And it's also, uh, the, also causes frontotemporal dementia to go kind of hand in hand. And these are mentioning other FUS progranulin, other proteins that go wrong. And again, just giving you kind of an overarching view that tau, alpha synuclein, amyloid, beta, those account for, again, for the majority of proteins that are going wrong. And that's where for the decades now, we've been, treatment and research has been targeting, like how do we stop this amyloid and tau and alpha synuclein? How do we slow it down? How do we reverse it? Those are, those are a lot of the studies you're reaching. That new Biogen drug, that's what it was hoping to do. And that's what it is targeting is an amyloid beta. That's, it's trying to hit that protein in a targeted way. So the diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease. Okay, let's get a little bit more detailed here. So again, the three stages, right? Preclinical, so people that are functioning normally, um, otherwise don't really notice, but are having some underlying pathology changes. Then they have a measurable change, that cognitive test you did with them or screening tool is showing changes, that's mild cognitive impairment. But again, they're functioning normally. And then dementia, they have the measurable change, but now they're uh, also having functional impairment, okay? So, you know, the core criteria really haven't changed since 2011, uh, since these papers that came out. Um, again, really looking for this pattern of slow, progressive decline. We've ruled out other reversible causes. They're having trouble with work, their daily activities. They're declining from their previous function. Um, again, not explained by other causes. And two of the following have to be impaired. So two or more, right? Short-term memory, impaired reasoning, visual spatial, um, driving, you know, orientation, uh, impaired language, and changes in behavior and personality. These are the kind of domains, right? And then the way they show themselves in life, right, is oh, I'm forgetting my appointments. I'm forgetting uh, what I'm doing. I can't follow this recipe. I'm double paying my bills or I'm missing bills. I'm having more trouble making decisions. All those things kind of add up. So that's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Alzheimer's disease diagnostic criteria. Okay. Now that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a possible Alzheimer's back here, right? Core criteria. Now to say that it's probable Alzheimer's, you want to meet the previous criteria and then have kind of what we already mentioned, right? So it's a slow progressive decline. <clears throat> There's a clear kind of downtrend. Um, we, you, you, when you look at the brain MRI, they don't have like severe vascular disease, you know, massive strokes or vascular disease, because then it makes it just harder to be confident because maybe it's the vascular disease that's causing it. Uh, you know, it's not Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal. You're kind of thinking about the other dementias. That's where I come in a lot of the time is to try to sort that out if there is concern for other things. So, you know, does a, does a patient look all of a sudden Parkinson, Parkinsonian? Are they having a lot of hallucinations? Are they having a lot of um, REM sleep behavior, like acting out their dreams at night? Um, is there just a huge um, like personality change that was atypical? These are things that kind of lead us to think, uh, maybe it's not Alzheimer's, maybe it's one of these other things. And so we rule that stuff out. And so the initial presentations of Alzheimer's disease tends to fall in a couple different buckets. The main one um, is amnestic. What do we mean? Amnesia, right? Loss of memory. That's the classic presentation. That's the vast majority of Alzheimer's disease. Keep in mind though, um, earlier on in Alzheimer's, you can have Alzheimer's that presents with language. And that's what I said earlier when I said logopenic primary progressive aphasia. More than 80% of those is caused by uh, Alzheimer's. 
That's because it just depends on where the Alzheimer's proteins are. In the, in the case of lopopenic, I've got Alzheimer's that's in usually the left side of my head in the parietal lobe. That tends to cause this variation of word finding. Logo is word, penic is loss of word. So logo being word finding difficulty. And that's, that's the kind of uh, symptoms you see early on. So that's a language variant, Alzheimer's disease. Visual spatial, well, maybe the proteins are, are kind of touching on some of the occipital lobe and parietal lobe more, kind of more posterior, not as much starting in the front where it might affect my memory. Well, you get posterior cortical atrophy syndrome. That can look a lot like Lewy body dementia. That's where I really have to come in and help kind of um, clarify what, what's going on there. But they're gonna have potentially visual hallucinations. They're not gonna be able to navigate their environment, trouble with driving tends to be earlier onset. Executive dysfunction, what's, what's our executive? It's our frontal lobe, the front of the brain. If the Alzheimer's proteins happen to start there, we're having decision-making issues, judgment issues, problem-solving issues. That's where we get that frontal variant Alzheimer's. Um, I just diagnosed someone actually just the other day with this, and this was somebody um, who, actually, I'll just, I'll just share the case with you later when we're going over the case presentation. I think that'll be a good one. And so again, language, visual, spatial, executive, the vast majority are gonna be memory presentations, but keep in mind, you know, some people have language issues, spatial issues, executive, and you might think, man, their memory's still pretty good. Well, that happens and that, that can still be Alzheimer's. So possible Alzheimer's, uh, in, when you're a little less confident, it's like, well, the course is not as typical. They're maybe having some ups and downs. It might be mixed with another condition. Remember we said it, it mixes with vascular disease quite a lot. Um, it can also mix with Lewy body dementia. We can have uh, mixed pathologies. And so unfortunately, if you have Alzheimer's disease, it does not mean you, you can't have Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's, right? That, that happens. So I've diagnosed many people with, with both. Then the possible and probable, right, with biomarker evidence. So many of you may not be aware, but we have the ability to confirm uh, Alzheimer's disease based on your spinal fluid, CSF biomarkers here. We have definitive Alzheimer's tests. Um, and I think that's still something that's not widely known. Um, we have um, amyloid and even tau PET scans, so very specified PET scans that go in and show you that that protein is in your brain. That's not quite, um, that's, those are available, but they're not paid for by insurance yet. So we're not really using them in mainstream. Uh, CMS, Medicare has indicated that they will pay for it. The IDEA study, which I did participate in, um, there's a second IDEA study now going on, Alzheimer's Association is helping with, those have demonstrated that there's an impact on people, meaning if they do that PET scan, um, decision-making changes, quality of life changes. So Medicare will do it it's just with COVID and everything else. We don't know when that's gonna happen. We do use FDG PET scans, like normal PET scans a lot of the time. Um, and, and we have more and more biomarkers available. And we'll get into this with the later uh, session about diagnosis and management, but just keep in mind, there are ways to really become more confident in the diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> What are the risk factors for Alzheimer's? Keep this in mind. What's the biggest risk factor? Age. After age 65, risk doubles every five years. So think about that. You know, so many families will say, oh, you know, my grandma, my grand, oh, everyone on my mom's and dad's side had Alzheimer or dementia or, you know, some kind of memory issue when they were older. And they're really worried about it for themselves. Well, you ask them and they say, oh yeah, they were all 95. That does not increase your risk as a family member. Late onset dementia and Alzheimer's don't increase your risk. Um, but think about how big the risk is anyways in the general population. I mean, it's 25 to 33% at 85 years old. So if you live to 100, you know, it's, you're, you're, you're kind of flipping a coin at that point, right? It's, it's a pretty high risk. Um, so risk um, increases if you have earlier, tends to be earlier onset. So not, not just regular, like if you have a bunch of family members that have even first degree that had it much, much later in life, that does not tend to increase your risk. Um, and we're getting better and better about genetics, right? So the uh, <clears throat> amyloid protein, uh, presinolin, uh, these are all risks. So if, if, you're, if you have these genes, they will increase your risk um, for sure. But, you know, again, less than 1% of all, Alzheimer's. These are very, very rare cause. That's why I say the vast majority of right, people ask, it's not genetic. And if there was, you would know it in your family tree. It'd be pretty obvious. And it tends to be earlier onset. Um, APOE4, people might be familiar with because things like the sort of mainstream genetic testing uh, companies like 23andMe, they, add, they can like include this in their health thing. Um, there's a lot of genes like this, but you know, that this, just to put in perspective, this doesn't increase your risk more than like hearing loss in midlife. So it's, it's an increase for sure, but it's not, 
some people get that report and freak out and come to me and say, oh my God, it says APOE in a dementia. Uh, it's really not a huge risk. I mean, it's something to consider. Vascular risk factors. Again, that's why it's so important to touch on these, these issues we talked about. And so for all of us here today listening, we can all have an impact on people's dementia and memory risk factors because we can all encourage them. Activities that help with hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes, sleep apnea, tobacco abuse, all of that, right? Um, like we said, vascular disease and Alzheimer's often found together. Head injuries, you really have to have some pretty severe and free and, and multiple head injuries generally to increase your risk. So if you've had a lot of mild, kind of a bunch of mild um, issues or just you know, even one or two, you guys, yeah, there's some increased risk, but it's, it's again, it's pretty low. Um, and we're obviously looking at, there's a big you know, research happening with gut flora, finding much more connection than we ever thought between our brain and our guts and our stomachs, um, you know, immune modulation. <clears throat> and so let me just take a moment here to pause. That was, that was a good amount of information. We talked about right the diagnostic criteria, the progression of dementia, the different types of dementia biologically, risk factors, what questions do people have? And, and you know, if you can um, jump on video or audio, please say it out loud. Uh, if not, just put it in the chat, please. I would love to just take a couple minutes here and answer some questions. I know folks have questions. It's, it's never happened that there hasn't been a question. Give me a moment and then we're gonna pull up the uh, case presentation form. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about the different places that the proteins um, build up, like uh, the frontal lobe, the one that was just overall memory loss, are the proteins all over the brain? Uh, right. So <clears throat> with amnestic or the memory loss, they tend to be in the temporal lobes or the medial temporal lobes. So kind of like deeper behind your ears, a little bit deeper in your brain. You know, when you're looking at the brain, it looks kind of like a boxing glove you know, this, this temporal lobe and deep structures inside like the hippocampus, those are where the proteins tend to go to cause that earlier memory loss. It's a classic presentation. And that's the memory circuit is all, the short-term memory circuit is all in there. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think we do. Yeah, we share the I think the recordings and the slides, right, Amber? Right. Yes, indeed. And I'm just posting the web the the right yeah, here. I've seen them from our previous echoes. Yes. Yeah, they they they've been easy to find, so that's been great. Yeah, I don't tend to usually send out the actual recordings themselves, and maybe I should start doing that just to remind people where the link is. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll try to do that when I when I ask you guys for cases. I'll just make sure and put the link to our website, and the, usually takes us about a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, that website's uh, very well updated, and I just was looking at it. <clears throat> Any other questions? Please, and you know, ask your questions as we as we continue. I want to be mindful of time, so I want to just um, move ahead a little bit here. So in terms of case presentation. Let me actually do something here and pull up the case form. And this is something I'm really want to want. I want folks to participate in uh, later on. Let me pull it up and see where it is. So you'll see on the website, and I believe, Amber, will it be on that same website, this case form? Yes. So I think. One second, folks. I'm gonna pull up the case form directly. So here it is. I'm just going to share. So what you guys will go online, and then you'll be able to see the case form. You'll just it, we try to make it easy. Fill up. I'm making a couple edits to it, but um, this will be essentially what it looks like. And I'll kind of walk through how I would fill it out for a case I just recently had submitted by. Um, uh, uh, Montana Hospital uh, Department that wanted some help. <clears throat> so this will be the form. So it's a fillable PDF. So just go ahead, you know, you kind of quickly fill it out. You know, you can say your, your information, you know, my name is, you know, you know, maybe it's one of the social workers, one of the nursing staff, one of the doctors, doesn't matter, you know, 
data request, clinical question. You can, don't worry if you don't have like a well thought out clinical question. We just, we want the cases. And that's exactly, again, where we can really put this knowledge while we're learning to use. So once you fill that out, you can kind of fill out the patient information here, you know, as you see education level again, right? One of the biggest risk factors for uh, when you're young is education level. So it's very helpful to know, you know, they only went through seventh grade versus, oh, they have a PhD or something. I mean, it makes a big difference on how we're thinking about things. Housing, employment, current neuropsychiatric diagnosis, Maybe they don't have one. Maybe it's just memory loss. Maybe it's mild cognitive impairment. Maybe they do have Alzheimer's disease. Um, other medical issues, prior or current medication, trials that are relevant you know, for the most part. And, and you might be surprised, you know, right? A lot of people are on a bunch of bladder medications that are anticholinergic. We'll talk about this in later, later talks. I wanna know that because that's gonna cause memory impairment, um, like the oxybutynins out there, right? Anything anticholinergic. Some people are taking Benadryl every night to sleep or Unisom or all those so many anticholinergic medications we're, we're getting when we're older, we don't even realize it. All that's going to mess you up. So I want to know all that stuff. <clears throat> some quick history questions, you know, uh, some basic psychiatric history. Is there psychosis? Yes. You know, this person had some delusions, paranoia, uh, mania, no, trauma, abuse history, no, prior psychiatric, yes. Um, several or two plus months, all later in life when this issue is starting, family neuropsychiatric history, sleep timing. Um, and this, well, I'll update this so it makes more sense. But basically, I want to know, you know, are they sleeping? They're sleeping 14 hours per day, <clears throat> time. And yes, there's, dis there's decision-making capacity concern. And then kind of, again, other, so again, is this vascular dementia? Is other stuff? So they have hypertension, diabetes. This person was actually pretty healthy, definitely had anxiety and depression, no hearing loss, had sleep apnea, um, and no other pain or falling issues. Most recent head CT impression, and I'll go through with in, in some of the later studies, and we, and we can actually look at this. Um, if you guys, if there is a head CT or a brain MRI or any other brain imaging, if you can send in your case ahead of time, I'll try to grab that imaging because I digitally have access to most images you know, in, in, your, in your states. Um, we call it our PAC system. It's an image management system. I have that online. And so I can digitally grab images from hospitals or, or clinics pretty quickly. I mean, often the same day. So if you have our case, let me know. You might say you know, that there is a brain MRI. I'll grab it because then we can actually look at it together. And I can show you some of the classic signs of Alzheimer's or other dementias right on the brain imaging. I do that with patients all the time family and caregivers. I, I always pull up their brain imaging if you work with me and we go over it. Their thyroid stimulating hormone level, hemoglobin A1C, B12, average blood pressure. These are the kind of main factors that could be reversible or treatable, right? And so maybe their brain MRI showed like a ton of vascular disease. Um, either way, but I'll try to, I'll try to get access to it. Um, did you do a MOCA cognitive test? You know, oh yeah, they had a, you know, this guy had a 19 out of 30 on MOCA, you know, in you know, September, 2020, whatever it might be. So just giving you a little, and then you might just talk a little bit about, okay, this is like a 75 year old man who has been treated for treatment resistant depression for two plus years, had over 30 ECT treatments, two plus you know, months in the, in Warm Springs, the state hospital, et cetera. And then what are my questions? Well, yeah, how do I handle, because he's living at home and he's, he's, he's having, needing more and more supervision. Um, I'm not even sure what the diagnosis is, um, issues of daily living, uh, determine patient's diagnosis, and then advanced care planning. Okay, and that's it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill that out and then you're gonna submit it. And I, the instructions for submitting are all online. And so I really, it's super important. Um, again, can't can, uh, kind of emphasize this enough. We, we absolutely, the ECHO model only works with these uh, cases. So please, please, please um, take a moment. Just if, if all of you just submitted one case over the course of the entire series, we'd be golden. So just keep that in mind. Just think of a case um, and, and that would be super helpful. So I'll tell you, just uh, spend a couple minutes because we, we don't have an official case for today. This was a really interesting case where this older gentleman in his 70s living at home in Montana, um, declining daily functioning, needing more and more supervision from family and his wife, um, was very, very depressed, apathetic, you know, sleeping a lot, 
had some ups and downs, had some paranoia and delusions in there, was thought to have depression with psychosis, received extensive treatment, many medications, ECT, everything. By the time he saw me, he was, he was kind of at the end of this and, and the providers were saying, listen, you know, as you're, as you're the only neuropsychiatrist in, in Montana, we just, we don't know what's going on. He saw some excellent psychiatrists. He saw some excellent providers, his primary care. I mean, people, I mean, his, his team was quite good. Um, it's just that these are rare presentations that we can't expect everyone to be aware of. So I, I kind of looked at him and said, okay, this is bizarre. Like, he's not having any improvement. He's had all these treatments that have cumulatively a lot of, uh, a lot of benefit. So we actually did a brain MRI and he had clear dementia on his brain MRI. Now it was advanced enough that I wasn't sure is a frontal temporal dementia because he's having so much apathy and depression. I was thinking maybe it's, it's something up here. That's what tends to cause that kind of symptom. But he was having short-term memory issues. I did test his cognition. I did memory testing. It was measurable. So it was MCI. Plus he had two or more domains of dysfunction. So he had dementia. He qualified for dementia based on the probable, you know, the, list, the criteria list we just went over. The question was, well, what was it? What's the underlying biology? Well, I ended up getting an FDG PET scan, which you can do anywhere that has a spec scanner, which many hospitals in, in your states do. So sent him to a local hospital, got the PET scan, and that helped me nail down, I think, the most likely diagnosis, which was not frontotemporal dementia, actually. I think in his case, it was frontal variant Alzheimer's disease, because he had the classic pattern of meta metabolism change, meaning FDG PET, right? You're putting a radioactive sugar in your brain, and you're seeing where's it's uh, patchy, where is it not being eaten up, which, which, which parts of your brain are broken and not eating the sugar. So he had the frontal low signal, but he also had the classic Alzheimer's signal. And so given everything else, you know, I diagnosed him with a frontal variant Alzheimer's disease. Now, great, we've achieved diagnosis, now what? Well, all of a sudden we can rally a lot of troops. He qualifies for a lot more, he's getting a lot more support. He has in-home care support now, gonna transition him to housing. Uh, a facility that will provide better support. His family just feels immensely relieved. I mean, immensely. I mean, the impact on the family and the caregivers can't be overstated in these situations. Because think about this, this has been years of them pulling their hair out, trying to help, don't know what to do, don't know where to go. And now, so they feel huge relief. We have a path forward. He's being treated properly. No more fall for risk, no uh, risk for fall, no more risk of like him just wandering off and doing something, um, unfortunately. And then we're also now customizing his stream plan. I was able to actually remove most of his medications because he does not have the classic kind of depression we thought he did. And so he's, he's actually overall doing better. Family's doing much, much better. There's a huge, there's a path forward. Much less impact on the healthcare system this way, right? Because we're not chasing things, ending up in a hospital for months at a time, getting admitted, going to the emergency room over and over again, things like that. So you can see there's just an endless, uh, very hard to quantify, but a huge impact for patients and caregivers, uh, families. Um, let's say thank you here. And then I'll stop sharing my screen. So October 27th, signs and symptoms of cognitive impairment, cognitive assessment tools. So again, that's gonna be really aimed at, you know, all of you. So whether you're a primary care doctor, work on the front lines outpatient, whether you're a social worker or a nurse in a facility, we're all, we all have a responsibility to identify cognitive impairment, you know, and help um, treat and accurately diagnose our patients. So this is really geared at um, a, a, a wide community. So we'll get into that next session. We have a few minutes left for uh, any questions. I'd love to answer more questions. I do also want to clarify that you don't necessarily have to like figure out what the next session is going to be and try to pair your case with mm -hmm. the actual didactic. Um, Dr. Gomi's very flexible. <laughs> so um, it's, it, it's much more interesting if we can all, um, all learn, all participate, all share, all learn. And so if you're, if you're struggling with, okay, we've tried all of this behavioral change stuff and I'm not making any impact, you know, bring it to the group. Um, somebody else might have some new ideas for you. And we'll, you know, I'll tie in the themes from the didactics to whatever case you um, submit. So that's a great point. In any case, don't hesitate. There's also an evaluation link in the chat that just got posted. If you can please uh, fill that out, that really helps us. And I've been, we've been taking in everybody's comments, trying to make sure that they're in the slides. You know, the, the content is addressing people's questions. <clears throat> 
And just a reminder that if you do want nursing, continuing nursing professional development contact hours, you absolutely must fill out the evaluation form. So that's a little bit of a carrot for us. Yeah, there you go. And uh, feel free to um, give us additional ideas too, so that we're always looking to improve these echoes and, and becoming more of a community of, of providers together. Anything else from anybody? Um, let's see, today we had like, I think the high was about 45 people that joined. So I hope you all can make it again next time and feel free to share on the website that I had. You can um, continue to share the registration links for folks and we will continue to add people as we go. So don't hesitate that if you missed one and there's somebody else on your team that would be very helpful. Um, I will put a plug in for having care teams attend um, simply because you know you might start to identify those um, areas in your practice that perhaps you need to shore up a little bit of, of whether that be assessments or earlier referrals to whomever or increasing in, in education. So, um, you know, feel free. And now we have the very tail end. We have a question. It's great. Hello, would you please discuss IV ketamine treatment for people with depression? So. <laughs> sure. That's, you know, uh, a little out of left field, but I'll, I'll, do, I'll do my best. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, th this is a, it's a, it's something that has, you know, a very decent body of evidence. I've, I've, we've, I've treated on the inpatient basis. I've had patients with, uh, this is over when I was more in training where we treated with IV ketamine. It is a thing, you know, you got to think about cost and access. It's, it's very hard. There is a bit of a push and some availability for oral ketamine treatment that has less evidence and a little bit harder um, to kind of justify, also still expensive. Um, but certainly it has has evidence, it's just a matter of, you know, the evidence shows that there's like over the first six to eight weeks, there's impact, but there isn't great evidence for it yet, you know, a year or two years, three years out, you know, the long term. So um, it's, it certainly is, a, is effective in the short term, it can be, um, but it remains to be seen that in overall evidence is not like, it, there's not a ton of evidence for it, but um, it, it is a thing. And it is mainly for treatment resistant depression. So that means people that have already tried you know, other medications. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And um, we'll see you everybody in two weeks. Absolutely. Yeah. Please come back. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.